have Mark Gulliam. Williams. Williams, excuse yeah. me. <laughs> and uh, Lori Plot Snyder, and she'll be joining us shortly. Uh, all right, thank you guys for coming. Okay, so as she's, my name is Mark Williams. I am the lead strength and conditioning coach for the United States astronauts. And I've been doing this for about 16 years now. So today I'm gonna give you a very, very, very brief, uh, in the amount of time we have, overlook of what we do from a conditioning standpoint, try to explain a little bit from a pre-flight, pre in-flight, and post-flight scenario. And this only deals with once a crew member is assigned to a station flow. This doesn't include any time pre, before they're assigned. We're not gonna get into any of that right now. We're just gonna talk about once they're assigned to a station flow. Okay, all right. So we're assigned, once a crew member is assigned to a flight, we're assigned with them. We're gonna be with them for about two years pre-flight, all the way through in-flight, and then all the way through post-flight. So we're with the crew member, that particular crew member, once we're assigned with them for about two and a half to three years of training. What we do is we provide the uh, supervised exercise programs, pre-flight, in-flight, post-flight. And today, as I said, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our philosophies, our goals, and specific goals of each scenario, pre-flight, in-flight, post-flight, and some of the, a little bit of program content as well, okay? Our aim, our aim pre-flight is to prepare astronauts for any physical contingency, prepare them for both expected and uninspected things. For an in-flight scenario, this would just be basically think of emergency egress, emergency EVA, anything that would be an emergency. We wanna be able to make sure that they can perform those activities. Okay, overall f philosophy. We work at function. So when we talk about function, we're just the capability to be able to do the task that you're given to do. For most of us, it's just normal activities of daily living. For these guys, it's part of that, but it's also pretty much EVA training, getting them through the, the EVA training, that type of stuff. We're gonna talk a little bit about increasing capability and increasing work capacity. We're gonna talk a little bit about program balance and how we try to balance a program, all right? We're gonna talk about the principle of periodization, which is how we apply what we do. Periodization, very simply, is a systematic way of manipulating the volume, the amount of work, so sets times reps plus a load over a given period of time where it builds upon itself. It's a way to progressively and safely overload the human system, pretty much is what it is. We do that by, like I said, manipulating volume, intensity, frequency, how often we do something, and how we select our exercises. Okay, first, we're gonna look at specific philosophies. We call it metabolic training. We don't call it we don't call it aerobic training, we call it metabolic training, cardiovascular training. The reason being is it's not just the aerobic system we're interested in tra tra training, we also wanna train the anaerobic system. So there's three energy systems involved in human movement. You have two anaerobic and you have one, or, and one aerobic. We wanna train all of them. And I'll get into a little bit how we do that. We focus pre-flight and post-flight. We encourage new activities. So if a crew member is just a big runner, we want them to be better at everything they do, not just running. We encourage swimming, rowing, cycling. We do a lot of jump rope. We do uh, many different things. We focus on interval training, not just long steady state, going out for that five mile run. It's also working on short distance sprint training, again, to train the anaerobic system of the body, all right? Resistive training, we focus on movement patterns, not muscles. And what I mean by that is that we don't pick a day and say, okay, today we're gonna to do chest, tomorrow we're gonna to do back. We don't, we don't look at it that way. We look at movements and we wanna focus our movements on what they do as their function. EVA for astronauts, some of them play sports, do other things, we'll, we'll, we'll incorporate that in there, just like you would sports specific training for any other athlete that you were training. And we focus our exercises on multi-planar, multi-joint movements. So we want to pick exercises that allow us to train through mo the most joints we can in any given time. So we want not a single joint movement like this per se, but a, a big movement. And in every single plane of motion you can move in. Again, we want to encompass the whole body, okay? Okay, so pre-flight, 
We want, we do muscle conditioning. We want to train strength, endurance, flexibility, power, coordination, stamina. This all deals with the muscle. We're going to work on metabolic fitness, which I talked about. We want, we want to train both the anaerobic and the aerobic system. And then we want to work on any areas of concern. So if we see weaknesses anywhere in, in particular crew member, if a crew member is very, very adapt to running, not very much in the strength training, we'll try to shift that paradigm a little bit, move them to more strength training, get them a little bit more off the aerobic. We want a more, much more balanced athlete or astronaut in this case. <laughs> um, we familiarize the astronauts with the in-flight exercise. So we train them on all the hardware that they'll be using in-flight. Here's an, uh, one of our crew members on our resistive exercise device, ARED. So we, we do training with them pre-flight on that. They also get exposure to the treadmill and the cycle as well. We also want to prevent injury, always want to prevent injury. And we spend a lot of time coaching and teaching proper techniques. Very, very important, especially when they get in-flight they are going to have six months or so with us not being there. They need to know what they're doing and how they're supposed to do it because we're not there to coach them and teach them everything all the time. Okay. All right, so as far as metabolic training, how do we accomplish this? Okay, we do anywhere between 10 to 50 minutes of steady state or interval exercise and anywhere between 65 to 100 percent of predicted maximal heart rate. Okay, so as I said, so think of going out for a nice steady jog, three miles, whatever it is. That's your steady state work. So that's gonna take X amount of time, to change the aerobic system. How we inter interwine, intertwine the interval exercises in is we do short, medium, and long intervals. And those can last, depending on what energy system we're trying to train, that will last anywhere from a 20 second sprint all the way up to a four minute interval, depending on what we're trying to do. And we rotate through those week to week on how we wanna train those, okay? And again, exercises included. We include running, cycling, swimming, sprints, and jump rope. We include everything we can possibly throw at them. Go ahead. Okay. Resistive exercise. 95 to 80, 85 to 90 percent of astronauts may come to us originally when they first get here. They're novice lifters, what we would consider novice lifters. So we spend a lot of time initially teaching them how to properly exercise, how to do the exercises properly. And mainly, not only the ones we're gonna do pre-flight, but the ones we're gonna do in flight. That's the most important. We focus on lower body movements. We wanna emphasize the musculature of the lower body and it prepares them for in-flight. Again, I'll get a little bit more than this when we get to the uh, in-flight, but there's a reason why we do this. And this is basically because all the losses that we see from in-flight, from, from the muscle standpoint or from bone, usually occurs from the waist down. So we're gonna focus mainly on these particular types of exercises to kind of work that musculature and work that bone. Okay, we, again, we use functional activities of daily living. Those are the things we wanna focus on. We break it down very simply into what we call triple extension, pushing and pulling. That's how we do it. So triple extension real quickly is a hip, knee, and ankle movement. So a squat, sitting down in your chair and standing up would be a triple extension movement. Therefore, we're gonna squat. We're gonna jump, right? We're gonna deadlift, we're gonna, we're gonna do different things. Pushing or pressing it would be anything moving away from the body, pulling to the body. And we can do that in vertical, horizontal, we manipulate it all over. Again, as many different angles as we can. There's also a fourth category, which would be a combination of triple extension plus pulling and pushing, but that's very, very advanced type of lifting, all right? Okay, this is kind of how periodization works. This is a very simple example, very simple example of linear periodization. And as you can see, you have sets times reps, that's your volume of work. And as, just like with anaerobic and aerobic systems, the muscle responds differently to the stimulus you give it. You can train just purely for strength, and you're gonna work in a certain volume and a certain intensity range, and you can train for, to make the muscles grow bigger, you're gonna train for a certain volume range and a certain intensity range. The key here, two, two things here is, as intensity, so as the repetitions go down, as you get less repetitions, the weight or the intensity that you're lifting is always gonna go up, okay? That would also apply if we were doing, applying periodization to running. 
as you're doing sprints, the less sprints you do, the shorter sprints, the speed should go up. If you're doing longer, the speed will come down. Again, you're, gonna, you're specifically trying to target a particular system. You gear that by manipulating these things. The other thing is that the idea is that each cycle here builds upon the previous cycle. So if we were to do this cycle, this cycle would then set us up for this cycle, this cycle would then set us up, and you just keep moving through those cycles. And it's a very systematic, safe way to progressively overload a body. And again, this can be applied, be applied just weight training, and it can be applied aerobically as well. So if we're doing uh, sprint training or, or steady state training or whatever, we can apply this as well, okay? Okay, in flight. Go ahead. All right, in flight goals. We wanna maintain crew health. We wanna protect for function and capability to some of the things we talked about pre-flight. We wanna minimize losses in strength, endurance, power, flexibility, coordination, stamina, metabolic fitness, and of course, bone. Bone is unique for the space flight. Air, you know, um, it's not something we deal with terrestrially that much. In our elderly, we do as they get um, osteopenic, but for the most part, uh, with the guys that I've grown up working with, athletes most of my life, that's not an issue. It was very unique when I came here working with stimulating bone. We want to maximize reconditioning. So what we've seen is the more they adhere to the program in flight, the better most people do post flight and in always injury prevention. In flight, they're scheduled two and a half hours of exercise a day, six days a week. Okay, we spend 1.5 hours on resisted training and about one hour on metabolic training. And that includes setup and cleanup. So that's not, they're not purely exercising for two and a half straight hours. They're usually, actually some of them do, but for the most part. And most do exercise seven days a week. So it's only scheduled six days a week, but most of them do exercise seven days a week. Go ahead. All right, this is our cycle. Uh, this is our SEVIS uh, in flight, and it's pretty straightforward. Just like I talked about pre flight, we design protocols. They're going to be based on some testing that Lori's probably going to talk to you in a little bit, some of the testing that we do. We, we get a measurement of VO2 peak. We'll, we will take those numbers and devise protocols around that, which will include not only steady state, but interval training, and there will be different short, medium, and long intervals within that, again, depending on what energy system we're trying to train or what we're trying to do at that particular time. Um, in flight, we do, uh, there is some testing that's done in flight, and from that in flight testing, then we sometimes can determine whether or not we want to up or down, move a program or move that particular protocol up or down. We'll increase as they get better, as they've been in flight longer, we'll increase the load or the watch that they're using and we'll we can increase duration. So there's many things we can do to manipulate what we're doing in flight from that standpoint, all right? All right, so this is our treadmill. This is T2, see this? All right, same thing here. Again, 10 to 50 minutes usually, short, medium, long intervals, steady state intervals. Again, programmed in, these will be based off of 70% of max heart rate of performance. So a lot of the stuff we'll do in the gym, we can look at crew members, we can determine pre-flight where they can run at a given interval, what speeds they can run at, we can just set the treadmill to those speeds. And again, we will manipulate load and speed as we move forward into the flight. One of the interesting things about running on the treadmill in flight, you can see right here she has a, she has a harness that's attached to her that's holding her to the treadmill. There's no body weight in zero G, so we gotta have a way to hold you to the treadmill. This takes a little bit of getting used to, to using. It's very uncomfortable putting your, your body weight just through your shoulders and account, account, around your waist, and you get some hot points, and it just takes a little bit to get used to. Most crew members start out at about 60 to 65% body weight, and then as we move through the flight, we'll increase that body weight as we go, all right? All right. In-flight resistive training, periodization. Again, we talked about that. I, what I, the example I showed you pre-flight was just a straight linear um, periodization. In-flight, we use a two method. We use a linear and we use an undulating, and I'll explain that to you here in a second. It's not anything you really need to, you know, go, oh, what the, you know, not a big deal. Exercise intensity. Starting loads are determined by A-RED training, which I showed you earlier, 
and what we're doing in the gym. So we get strength measurements, we know where they are, we know how we can, where we can start them at. Also, on A-RED, in flight, 70, we use 45 to 75 percent of body weight, we add that to lower body movements. So if you take a 200 pound individual in the gym and he squats 200 pounds, technically that's 400 pounds in flight, right? because you gotta remove their body weight out. So we have to add that body weight back in somehow. So we pick somewhere between 45 to 75%. It's usually based on a crew member. There's a problem with that though. Our body weight is distributed equally all through our body. In flight, you're gonna now take their body weight and place it one point right here on their, on their back, which becomes an issue because the strength of the back. So depending on the crew member, how much weight training they do will depend on where we go with that a little bit because we'll manipulate that a little bit per crew member because we got to get them used to having carrying that much load on their back. Back becomes an issue, all right? Okay, so this is how the system's basically broken down. You have, we have three routines. Consider this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Think of it that way. It might be an easier way to think about it. And this is actually what we do in flight, all right? We rotate through these through, through the week. I'll show you that here in a second. The important part here, the stuff in the blue, is you'll notice, remember earlier in pre-flight, I said that we, we focus on the lower body activities, right? You'll see that we do some form of squat and some form of deadlift every single day, all right? And this is basically focusing, again, on that lower musculature, lower body musculature, and, lower mu and, and bone. And there's a reason why we do that. Go ahead. All right, so this is how the session's broken up. Okay, so this is the typical, this was just a typical nine weeks, looking at it nine weeks. So what I want you to see here is when you look over here at the load, based on, again, based on those pre-flight loads, you see a very linear increase in load. So this is each week builds upon each week. So we basically go up about 5% each week is how much load we're applying to the body. What you'll see across the top is you'll see the six days, those three routines. We have a, what we consider light volume days, heavy volume days, medium volume days. So we see a four set of six, a four set of 12, and a four set of eight. Those stay the same. So we go light, heavy, medium, light, heavy, medium. Now where the undulating comes in is how we manipulate. So you see these, they go A, B, C, B, C, A. What this does and why we do this, there's multiple reasons. One is that it tricks the body, okay? Every time we change how we do an exercise, we go from a normal stance to a wide stance to bringing the, the leg in the middle of the body, it changes the angle in which the load is going through the hip. And by doing that, right, it changes the musculature and how it pulls upon the hip, which therefore gives us hopefully, in what we've seen so far, is it's working fairly, we're not completely there yet, but it's working fairly well, it, that's how we attack the bone. We never allow the body to become accustomed to any particular stimulus. So by changing the angle that the load comes into the hip, by changing the volume every single day, by changing the intensity or the load that they're lifting every day, they're never doing anything the same day. Every day is different, all right? Okay, post-flight. All right, post-flight, deficits, things we see. As you can imagine, we see decreases in all these areas. Metabolic, so we see decreases in anaerobic fitness, aerobic fitness, strength, power, endurance, stamina, bone, balance, all through. These are all components of fitness, endurance, agility, coordination. We see uh, change in orthostatic tolerance, appropriate reception, nervous vestibular function, which is unique to space flight, and flexibility. Now, these deficits vary widely per crew member. Some crew members have certain things that are really, really out of whack, and some don't have that much out of whack, and some might have, might have lost a lot, a lot of strength, but over here they're very, very good, and other ones might be very, very bad over here, and very, very good over here, it just depends. We'll tailor our post-flight to how we want to deal with that, all right? Okay, so when we get the crew members home, we, we just start visually, just from doing this for so many years, you can just visually pick up things very quickly where certain things are going on. All right, 
from that, we are, there's also testing done post-flight, and we use that testing as well, and Lori will get into probably a little bit of that as well. All right, so um, we basically want to focus, we're, we're going to cover the whole spectrum of everything, but if there's an area that any crew member is particularly really, really bad in, we are going to really focus on that one particular area and really try to get that back up to par again. All right. When we started post-flight conditioning, I started back, I was coming, I came on at sort of towards the end of MIR, and some of the stuff that we did at that time, compared to what we do now, is night and day. Uh, we were very, very conservative. We didn't know what to expect, and we didn't know how much crew members could handle or what we could do with them. We've gotten very, very aggressive, much more aggressive over, uh, over the last 10 years and it definitely decreases the amount of time we have to spend with them post-flight to get them back to their, their, their pre-flight levels. Also, since the introduction, we've gotten hardware on orbit now with the A-RED, the new resistive exercise in the, in the, in the treadmill, C T2, we're able to prescribe exercise the way that we wanted to from the very beginning. For the first 16 or 17 increments, we weren't allowed to do that. Our hardware limited us on how we could train in flight. Now we're able to train exactly the way we fully want to, for the most part, and, it's, and it has shown improvements that way. All right. Okay, so readaptation begins as soon as those guys start feeling gravity. They're already things they're starting to adapt already. So, for as far as we're concerned, we get them on R plus one, and our post-flight reconditioning lasts 45 days. So we have them for 45 days after that. We're scheduled for two hours every day, seven days a week. That doesn't mean we do that every day a week. If the crew member needs a day off, we give them a day off. Um, if they need two days off, we might give them two days off. I mean, it's, it just varies per crew member, but it is scheduled, hard in line, two hours, seven days a week for 45 days. And then if a crew member for chance needed, we needed to do something longer, we can ask for extended period of time if we needed to do so. Okay, reconditioning is a dynamic program, again, no different than pre-flight. We use functional movement patterns, so we want to do exactly the same things we're doing. And very simple, another way to look at that, we want to do things with our feet on the ground. We don't want you sitting in a chair, we don't want you laying down, we want you standing, just like we function as most of our lives, we're standing up, moving. We, we pick exercises that focus on feet on the ground. We want to train in multiple planes, again, using multiple joints, and again, we tailor it to that individual crew members' deficits, all right? We do a functional fitness assessment in and of ourselves, different from other testing or exercise, countermeasure stuff that's going on that Lori's gonna talk about. Um, we do basic push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups. We do some strength measurements. We do some flexibility measurements. We do an agility test where we have them running through cones and changing directions and doing different things, so we wanna see how that functions. And we do that at L minus 60, and then we do it at R plus 7 and R plus 30. So the R plus 7 gives us immediate feedback on where they are compared to when they left. The R plus 30 then also tells us where they are now once they've gone through 30 days of post-flight reconditioning. All right? All right, so our, uh, starting at R plus 1 up to the first week, we work on basic am emulation, simple walking stuff. I have some videos I'll show you later, just some different things of some stuff we do. We emphasize, we work a lot on their vestibular. Again, I talked a little bit about that. It's unique to some of the stuff we do in space flight. Uh, work on, a, which working on nerve vestibular is gonna work balance and coordination. They kind of go hand in hand. We wanna work on flexibility, um, resistive exercise. We start free weight activity uh, from day one. On mirror, we wouldn't touch a weight for probably three to four weeks. Now we actually do it on R plus one. We have them lifting weights already. Again, increased metabolic conditioning, same things we've been doing. And then once the functional fitness is complete, we'll, we'll add in some other complexity things to it. All right, okay, so from R plus eight all the way to 45, everything progresses in difficulty, progresses in intensity. Once we give a crew member a task and they can perform a certain task, if it's a balanced task, we add another complexity into it. And as soon as they can perform that, we add another complexity into it. So we just keep making it more difficult as we, as we go through it. Different stimulus, and it just it changes things completely. All right? So how we would progress, just a simple way of how we would progress, just from metabolic training, we basically start them out on the cycle. 
So we get them home. The first thing we do is we put them on a cycle. Putting them on a cycle gets the legs moving, gets the muscles working, gets the blood pumping. Sometimes if they have orthostatic issues, if you put them directly up on a treadmill to begin with, blood rushes out of their head, they become presyncopal. They could, that could happen. We don't do that. We haven't, I haven't personally ever seen that happen because we don't do that. We start them on the cycle. Then we will go, we'll move to a progression. We'll go up to upright, something upright. Now gravity, they got to work against gravity, pump, pump a little harder, but it's still control. We have an, intra, we have an underwater um, treadmill which is usually what we use now as opposed to the elliptical trainer, so we can unload them a little bit and, and get them running faster. It helps the muscles work a little harder. We'll go from that to running on the treadmill where we're, we can actually watch them, make sure that they can do this, nothing's gonna happen, and then we'll eventually let them progress to running outside, which is where they wanna go because they've been cooped up in a can for six months. Okay. Uh, mobility and balance and appropriate reception, we just go from very simple, very, very simple things to just standing on one leg and balancing to walking and twisting. We'll move into speed ladders where we're doing agility work, cone drills, running around cones and changes of direction. And then we'll, and from a jumping, we'll move from very simple things, jumping little, over little bitty cones, back and forth to jumping on boxes, you know, a couple feet box. All right? Okay. Okay, so exercises we perform every day. Every day we do start off, we do some form of cardiovascular metabolic training, and it's going to be somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. Again, it'll have a mixture, sometimes a steady state, some interval stuff. We do a dynamic warm-up, and the dynamic warm-up is basically it's movement. It's not, it's not laying on the floor like if you think of um, like yoga, you know, where you're sitting on a mat and you're just stretching. We're gonna do stretching, but we're gonna do it dynamically. We're gonna make them walk and move while they're doing it. Again, we wanna add much more complexity. We can train balance, coordination, and flexibility all at the same time. But it, it, it creates, it trains them a little bit harder. We do core and trunk stability every day, and then we do some form of static stretching every day as well. So we do end, usually end the day with static stretching, but for the most part, for the warm up, it's all dynamic. All right, go ahead. Okay, so go ahead and go to the next. Okay, so this is very quickly, this is just a quick little video just showing you. So this would be, uh, if you click on it, it should come up. So this is one of our crew members. So this is, this is week two. So this is week two, this is week three. So week three, he's already on the treadmill, running on a treadmill. And, if you, and what we would look at would be looking at the gate, whether they're moving across the treadmill, whether how much they move back and forth whether they can keep up with it, that kind of stuff. This is part of the dynamic warm-up. A second ago, you saw the crew member doing start with shoulders. Here we're doing some back extension and flexion. Again, feet on the ground movement. Here's, what, here's a wall squat where we're working on flexibility of the back and the shoulders, opening up the hips. Here's another example of the same thing, just a different activity. Um, same thing, just a different activity. And there's, there's things that we look for whenever they're doing these exercises. It's, I could spend hours just telling you all the things that we look for. This is, here he's doing again, same thing, dynamic warm up. Here he was doing forward, backward, extension, flexion. Here he's doing lateral, so this lateral movements. So just warming up, warming up the trunk, warming up the core and the back. Again. That's the difference between week two and week three. You see him, he's, he's much more dynamic, much more movement, much more fluid in his movements. This is a balance drill where you're actually supposed to stand on one foot and go over and touch your toe and lift the back foot off. Again, adding flexibility, balance, and coordination. Difference between week two and week three. Here's just working on warming up the hips. Again, that's probably week two. Week three, a little bit different, a little more dynamic. This is just flexibility. All right, if you want, you can, okay, it's over, great. Okay, this is, we're gonna look here, we're gonna look at some videos, some core, some different core stuff we do. So this would be, um, this would be very, this is kind of where we start. So this would be week two. So he's doing 
He's doing some rotation through the core. He was doing some, uh, this is more dynamic. Full body, full motion all the way up and down. This is definitely more dynamic. This is kind of progression. So we start them on the floor, we'll move them to working in that. This is just a balance movement. This is just stabilization of the core. Pretty straightforward, we do, we do those. Just to give you an example, some of the stuff that we do. Here's a rotation. This, is, this would be week two, week three. Much more dynamic, much harder. Again, week two on the floor, just basically working on the lower back. Again, working on the lower back, week three. Progressing through it. All right. Okay, exercises we perform every other day. So every other day we do resistive training. And then on the other days, we work on general performance. So we work on conditioning, we work on agility, we work on speed, we throw around a medicine ball. We're working on power, we do jumping drills. So this next video is gonna be some, a video of some, a, a little bit of that, just kind of talk through it. So this is, again, this is week two. We're already putting weight back on their back. We start them squatting already. Here he's doing deadlift, no different than anything he was doing in flight. He was doing this for six months, every day a week in flight. So just, just basic weight training, some basic weight training move, movements. Now, here's some of the conditioning. So this is a med ball. So here we're working on balance, coordination, hand-eye coordination. Again, the difference, you see a little more fluidity week three to week two. A little more fluid. Same thing, just a little different with two hands as opposed to one. Here's one of those walking and twisting movements. This looks very simple. This is not that simple. <laughs> Post-flight, after six months in flight, this is, especially backwards, this is not that simple. <laughs> so, emulation, some of the stuff we talked about, heel toe, just walking over cones, teaching the muscles to fire again. Now, going backwards, watch. Step on cones, walks off line. So there's just different things we look for and how we, we can gear whether they're getting better or not. Here's just some med ball stuff. Again, we have med balls that range from six, from six pounds up to, up to 22 pounds. And as they get better and more progressive, we increase the load. We increase the weight that they're doing it. Here he's working on some core uh, and, and back power. Same thing here. Same thing there. Different, I just showing you the difference between a week makes and post flight. Balls are much heavier too on the seg. Again, just working core, nerve vestibular. You want to see that one doesn't work, nerve vestibular, that that will if you have nervous vestibular problems, that'll wake you up real quick. All right? Okay, here's some agility stuff. So this is going through the ladder. So this is some of the stuff we work with agility, coordination. Just as an example. just to show you some different things. And you can get, and you can get as, as whatever your imagination will use. You can, you can make this more difficult, as easy as you want, as hard as you want. And you can see right there, he's already picking it up pretty quick as he gets going. Is this all done in the same day? Yes. So here's going through some cones. Here's going through backwards. <laughs> backwards much harder. <laughs> Here's a couple of jumping, just example of a few of the things we do jumping wise. We always tell them we're training them for, we're getting ready for when they retire and then go and dance it with the stars. <laughs> okay, all right, so again, conclusion, our overall focus, we're always gonna focus on functional movements. We want our feet on the ground, we want to mimic as much things, as many things as we do in our normal daily lives, 
all right? We want to work on increasing our capability. We won't want to be good at one thing. We want to be good at as many different things as we can. We want to work on increase, create, or increasing work capacity. We want to be able to do more work over a given period of time. And we want to create balance in our programs. So we want our programs to be balanced. It shouldn't be all running. It shouldn't be all weightlifting. It should be a combination of both. All right, our pre- and post-flight programs are designed, we use that principle of periodization. We're always trying to build upon itself. It's a very safe and systematic way, and, and science has proved out over and over again, it's one of the best ways to train. Training programs are evolving as we gain more experience with long duration space flight and as research, as we get more research, and we're learning stuff all the time. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm in. Do what? The tag, I'm in. <laughs> it's the one called SA Academy. Yes. Yeah, so you, there's no way to do. Yeah, there would be no way to do, I mean, you could think, you could probably do, you couldn't train them on the A-Red, I don't believe. Yeah. There's just not a physical way to do it. So you just train them on how to use the machine and best prepare them for when they get to zero G. And once they get to zero G, it's a completely different animal. And what does <laughs> that learning curve look like once they get on all that? Um, for A-Red, it's about, I would say, two weeks where they get fairly comfortable with it. And then on T2, it's more or less just the harness. The treadmill's a treadmill. Yeah. You know, you're buckled down. They, they don't know up or down. They just get on it, turn it on, and run. It's just getting used to wearing the harness and being loaded through the shoulders and that kind of stuff. So. And then you mentioned you don't get involved with crew when they don't have a current assignment. I'm sorry? You don't get, get involved until they actually get assigned to Oh, no, no, no. We're working with them way before that. We've, before they're even assigned to us? Oh, yes. Once they're, once they're assigned, once they're selected in the office, they're, okay. we're working with them. Just, so, it, so it might be five, six, seven years before they're assigned. We're, we've been working with them that whole time. Just the training regime? regime just the, what I showed you there is just basically once they're assigned to a flight. That doesn't include any time prior to that. Does it look similar? Yeah, it's fairly similar. We're going to be a little more open with what we'll do once until they're assigned. Uh, so we'll do we'll throw a lot more stuff at them in that in that period than we probably would once they're assigned. For the one-year crew member, how is your philosophy going to be changing? I mean, normally at the six-month mark, they're they're training to come back, but at that point, they're going to be training to okay. either avoid what the trends are. Well, maybe? yeah, it, it's it's going to be a learning curve. We don't know. True. Yeah. Um, I was talking a little bit about this how we do the cycles okay so for a normal crew member we do two cycles in flight we do a three we do two three month cycles so initially the first thought is we're just going to break it up into four cycles <laughs> right so that's pretty much what we're that's how we're going to approach it i think the more the harder part is going to be keeping him um, motivated to do the things that we need him to do for a year because it's not in the gym, I have a vast array of things I can change to say, okay, we're going to do something different. Let's go do this now. Right. It's the same treadmill every day for a year. It's the same resistance every day for a year. It's going to be very much. It's going to be a lot harder to figure out how to make it more interesting for it. So, I haven't decided exactly how I'm going to manipulate all that stuff yet. We're going to we're going to we're going to try some different things with him though for that flight. But it will be it will regardless it'll still be four three month cycles we're just going to we're just going to change how we're doing some things each cycle so each cycle might be a little different it won't be exactly the same and have you when you're on orbit and the amount of astronauts have the date have you seen anything like when the brain goes up there and it's like zero g and it starts shedding the stuff and you're trucking it to try to do it do you ever think there'll be a point where you get to a point where you can't trick it anymore or, or when you're coming back it's going to be really tough because the brain got used to yeah. Not doing something in a, in one G environment. Well, With I the think muscles and the cornage. Well, yeah, because no matter what, it's always it's always shutting itself down. Right. So it's all you're always losing the 
it's constantly, it's just how fast can we slow that or can we even take it back in that direction. I think everybody's a little different on how to, because everybody, every crew member reacts differently to space flight. I mean, we, on shuttle flights, when I did shuttle flights, when we were flying shuttle, I mean, you have six people come back, and all six moved different. They all did the exact same thing. All right. All right? We, and we didn't do any training in flight, really. Yeah. Right? They just went up for 14 days, came home. Okay. All different. Some guys are, I mean, you couldn't even tell they went to space flight. And other guys, just, you're like, oh, you know, what happened, right? So everybody accepts it a little differently. Now, lifting weights, what it does to my muscles will do to your muscles will do to his. How, it, how fast it will do it with mine and how fast it will do it or, or somebody else's are different, right? But if I lift weights, I'm going to get stronger, period. You'll get stronger. Everybody, I just might get stronger faster depending on how I lift compared to how you lift. So it's just a matter of, again, how fat, how, how long could you train? I have no idea. This is gonna be a huge learning curve for all of us and what we're gonna do and how we're gonna, and how we're gonna counter react it. Because it might not, be, what's gonna turn out, it might not be just we can do it with countermeasures or with exercise countermeasures. It might be, there's gonna to have to be, if we're gonna do longer duration flights in the future, it's gonna to have to be what we do with with some type of pharmaceutical intervention, countermeasure or whatever, that's going to help that. Yeah, are there any thoughts on, right now you go 1G, 0G, and back 1G, but when you go to Mars, you're going to be going 1G, long 0G, then you're going to be at Mars gravity, then you're going back 0G. Uh, is that really throw in a big, because of your brain's being um, changed around two different ways? And is that something that you know? It's come up, but it's no. We haven't really just started really discussing in depth about that yet. I think we're a ways off before we really. But uh, I mean, definitely going to a to a, a lesser going to a lesser gravity planet is going to have an effect from this the space flight. But it's still it's still less than we have here, so it's still negative regardless from from the one G. So what you probably have, depending on how long we spend on Mars, you could have go to space. You have the drop get to Mars, you're gonna have an uptick because you have some gravity. Get back in zero G, it's gonna drop again, then you're gonna get home and then you're gonna and then you gotta deal with it when you get home. You know. So I mean most of the things anything that we've seen post flight we can handle or in flight, things that are space flight related, I mean, we can handle them post flight. Just sometimes it might take longer to get them back to where we need to get them, but we can get them there eventually. So have they seen any long term things you haven't come completely back, and some crews are, again, variability in the crew? No, I think I, would, uh, no everybody, I mean, nowadays, everybody seems to be fairly back to normal within that 30 to 45 day mm -hmm. period. They seem to be very functional, able to do things, feel like that they're, there's some things, if I could stress them, I mean, I could take it and make them do something exercise-wise that I could push them and go, yeah, I'm not quite there yet, but just from normal, what they do on a daily basis, yeah, they're back to where they were. Mark, yeah. you said after the mirror that you were very conservative yes. about, and so uh, how did that change? What 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 made you guys change your mind and, and be more? Well, I uh, okay from the mirror. From mirror, for example, we didn't mirror. We didn't have any. Ex most of our experience on duration post flight stuff was with what the Russians did. So we just kind of looked at kind of what the Russians were doing and we sort of follow that, maybe tweak it a little bit. And you see, my first increment was increment three. That was my first increment. And I started weight training with them because I'm a strength coach. So of course my, 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 I'm always gonna go to the strength side of things. You know, I'll talk aerobic, but you want me, I'm, I'm a strength guy. Uh, so I started in weight training much sooner than we ever had. And he, he was fine. So the next crew, I added a little bit more. The next crew added a little bit more, a little bit more. And by the time we got to increment, by the time we got to increment nine, I was doing things that the Russians thought I was completely crazy when I, when I showed them what we were doing. Um, but our guys were recovering. Our guys, 30 days into flight, post flight, were ready to go back to work. They could fight T38s. So they could go. The Russians couldn't, but our guys could. So it just led me to believe that we can. The body's much more adaptable than we think it is. And we always like to say we force adaptation through exercise. So we're forcing them to do it. I mean, you could just sit in the chair and not do anything, and eventually you'll adapt back to where you need to be. But for us, we wanted to force it. 
So we just, again, we're not doing it to the point of injury or to hurt them, but we, we want to force their systems to work. As a, a brief introduction, I'm Lori Plout Snyder from the Exercise Physiology Lab. I have a PhD in physiology and I have kind of an interesting story because when I was a PhD student, I worked at Kennedy Space Center doing research there back, way back in the day when life sciences was at Kennedy. Um, and so I got my start there. I, when I finished my PhD was about the time when life sciences was moving from, from Kennedy to JSC and there was a lot of turmoil. So I went and I did a postdoctoral fellowship at Michigan State University in um, radiology and physiology, specifically using MRI techniques to evaluate skeletal muscle. Um, after that, I was on the faculty at Syracuse University um, and I had an interesting joint appointment in exercise science and physical medicine and rehab, um, which spanned both the regular university and the medical school. And I spent 14 years there doing research um, largely related to my roots at Kennedy, which was unloading and skeletal muscle, but in special populations. So we did a lot with how um, skeletal muscle strength, power, endurance, and how that relates to everyday function. Though since I was at a medical school, it wasn't so much in astronauts, it was in um, individuals with Down syndrome, cerebral palsy. And these are fairly interesting because some of these people are limited in their everyday activities or their occupational opportunities as a result of muscle strength, endurance, and weakness. We also did a lot of work with aging and developing strength thresholds below which everyday function would be impaired. And this is really important because a lot of um, older adults go into hospital bed rest, and probably everyone in this room knows someone, an older adult who was kind of frail to begin with. Something happened, they got two or three weeks of bed rest in a hospital, and they lost their independence, and they were discharged to a rehab facility or a nursing home, not to their own home, because of poor muscle strength, endurance, balance, coordination, aerobic fitness. So we spent about 15 years researching that whole thing. How strong do you need to be to live independently? Um, if you're someone with Down syndrome, how strong do you need to be to have a manual labor job? Um, and a lot of mapping of muscle strength to function. I came here about six years ago um, when there was an opportunity in the exercise physiology lab. And the thing that was really exciting to me about coming here was the oppor opportunity to have one foot in the research side and one foot in the operations side and work with people like Mark and the ACERs to try to understand where are we going with exercise, how can we improve things. Um, and so that's what led me here. Um, what I'm going to tell you about today, and the first half of the presentation will be fantastic without slides. The second half will make the slides available. Um, but Mark talked a lot about how aggressive the exercise program has become over the past decade or 20 years. And so exercise has always been a part of the missions, even way back in Gemini there were exercise devices. Now they were simple like hand grip things and elastic straps and, and over, we have 50 years of experience. I mean, we collectively NASA have 50 years of experience with exercise, ranging from the very simple exercises to the very complex equipment that we have on station today, which is the A-RED, um, Mark mentioned briefly that that gave us a new capability. So the previous, when he talked about Mir and those missions that he was involved with, they didn't have a resistance exercise capability. Then on ISS, we got IRED, which had a limited capability, and the ACERs weren't able to prescribe the kinds of loads and the workouts that they, they knew should work. So we were kind of stuck. With the advent of ARED, they're able to get about 20 some different exercises that you can do on the A-RED with loads up to 
what they would want to prescribe. So that was a game changer with respect to exercise programming. The other big capability that improved roughly five years ago was the new treadmill. So we've had a treadmill for a very long time. The new treadmill is T2, and its big upgrade was a wider belt, and that may not sound like much, but anyone who's run on a treadmill knows how hard it is to run if the belt is really narrow because you have to be worried about staying on the belt. So this, this was a COTS off the shelf woodway treadmill that was modified for space flight. So it's a nice wide belt like you'd find in a gym and it allows for higher speeds. Now, why would higher speeds be important? Because crew members like to run at higher speeds you can get a better cardiovascular workout. Um, but there are some other reasons, and I'll talk about those in a minute. And then we have the SEVIS, the tried and true cycle that's been up there for a long time. Um, so three exercise capabilities, ARED, T2, and SEVIS. Um, I mentioned with T2 that its, it's upgrade capability is because you could get a better aerobic, or Mark called it a metabolic workout. But we recently completed a research study looking at the treadmill. It was called Treadmill Kinematics. John DeWitt was the, the principal investigator for that study. And the treadmill is instrumented with force plates. So every footfall that, that happens, the ground reaction force is recorded. Maybe not every single one, but you can set it to, to record. So with video motion analysis, where you, you've probably seen videos of this, where you put markers on the joints and then you videotape it and you can make a stick figure and analyze the joint angles. The combination between that and the, the ground reaction forces led us to be able to do a kinematic study of treadmill running. And one of the things that we were really interested in are, can, are crew members getting 1G light ground reaction forces when they run on the treadmill? Mark showed the harness and they, can, they have to put all the load on their shoulders and their hips. And, and so not very many people put 1G loading, like their whole body weight on that harness because it's uncomfortable. 60, 70% is more in, in the ballpark of where people are. So one of the questions was, are they getting 60 to 70% of their ground reaction forces on the treadmill? Are they getting more, are they getting less? And one of the most exciting findings from that was that when you run fast, you increase the ground reaction forces a lot. And you can get 1G-like walking ground reaction forces, so the reaction forces I'd get doing this, I could get in space with 60 or 70% on that harness if I ran really fast. So, so it gave some, some support and some evidence to the, the notion of having a faster treadmill, faster speeds. And um, we think this is pretty important for bone moving forward. So, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about was exercise physiology in general and how we got the evidence in support of the programs that Mark told you about. And one of the, the interesting things is that Exercise physiology is a very integrative science. So when we talk about exercise physiology and countermeasures as a lab or as a discipline, what we're talking about is the, the integration of all of the systems that make exercise. So you, you think of the heart and the lungs for the breathing and the cardiovascular fitness. You also have the muscles you immediately think of for strength and endurance and power. Some of the systems that, that don't get thought about so much would be the blood vessels that is supplying the muscles with oxygen and this communication between how much oxygen can I consume and what can the muscles actually use. So Mark mentioned targeting specific systems with the intervals. Remember he mentioned the 30 second interval, the two minute interval and the four minute interval and that they were targeting different parts of the system. So we went in, looked in the research and, and the really cool thing about each of those is that the 30 second intervals, so this protocol, I'll go into a little bit more detail on it in case you wanna try it at home. It's eight 30 second all out sprints. You can do this on a bike, you can do this on a treadmill, you can do this out on the road, you can do this swimming, elliptical. T pick your favorite activity. 
do a nice warm up. It has to be a pretty solid warm up to get you up at about 80% of your max heart rate to start with. And then 30 seconds all out, you're trying to hit your max heart rate. You get a whopping 15 to 20 seconds rest, and then you do it again. It is, for real, a 12 minute workout. That includes the warm up and the cool down if you go about five minutes for each. Why would we do this? I mean, it almost sounds like one of those infomercial kind of things, right? Like the 12 minute workout will, will make you great. Well, there's a lot of research evidence that this is really super effective for one part of, I call it the cardiovascular system, but it's the interface between the muscle and the cardiovascular system. So the capillary density, the amount of capillaries surrounding an individual muscle fiber, you actually grow new capillaries really quickly. And so this will cause new capillary growth so you can better perfuse the muscle. That means you can get more oxygen to the muscle, you can get more CO2 out, you can regulate its pH and, and all of its metabolism better. It is really, really good at increasing the oxidative and glycolytic enzymes in the muscle. So what does that mean? That means you're gonna increase the enzymes in the muscle that are responsible for the contraction and the metabolism. And you get unprecedented increases in these things with this little 30 second workout. Um, it is really effective for that. Does it do much for growing your heart or your VO2 max? No, really it doesn't do much, but it is amazing at the peripheral side of things. It's also really, really hard if it's done correctly. It, and we've had several crew members come back and they either love it or not. But the ones who love it say, oh, I love it because it's so efficient. Oh, I just spend a little bit of time, I feel like I had a great workout and, and then I'm done. Um, so that's why we're doing the 30 second interval. Now he also mentioned a medium interval. We're calling medium two minutes. And the medium interval looks like six two minute intervals in a, in a pyramid, if you think. So again, you warm up, you do two minutes at 70%, and then you get a two minute active rest. So you don't just get to sit down, but you can, let's say you're doing this on a cycle, you can pedal lightly, to let your heart rate recover part way, let your legs recover. And then it's two minutes at 80% active rest, two minutes at 90% active rest, The the peak is two minutes at 100%, and then you come back down 90, 80, 70. So this is kind of a pyramid of two minute intervals. Now, what is this good for? If you go into the research literature and you look at studies that have done this, this is really good for VO2 max, so that's the maximal aerobic capacity. Stroke volume, that's the amount of blood the heart pumps in one beat. Uh, cardiac output, that's the total amount of blood that the heart can put out. This is really good for, the, for, for those types of things. It's really um, good for muscle blood flow to the muscle. Um, and so it serves a niche purpose that I call kind of intermediate. If the 30 seconds are peripheral, this is, this is the next bit up. And then the four minute intervals. The four minute intervals, there's four of them at 90%. And then you get two to three minutes of active rest in between. These are really, they, they found their home or their origin in cardiac rehab in Europe. So this is a really popular protocol that they do with heart failure patients. And it, it, when I first heard that, I raised my eyebrows because I thought this sounds pretty hard for, for cardiac patients, but it is really good at building the heart. So increasing the thickness of the left ventricular wall, um, increasing the mechanics of the heart. The heart, you may think of it as contracting like this, but it's more like wringing out a sponge. So the heart contracts like this. So it contracts this way, it twists, and it contracts this way. So these different mechanics of the longitudinal, the radial, and the twist are all improved a lot with this four minute interval workout. So we're affecting the heart, kind of the middle and the periphery by choosing a 30 second, a two minute, and a four minute. Now, it would, typically people who 
like the 30 second, don't like the four minute and vice versa. You sort of get into your sprinter distance kind of, kind of group of people. But if you can do each of these once a week, you're targeting a different part of your physiology once a week, emphasizing what Mark said, that we try to mix it up as much as possible. It also helps with motivation, boredom, because who wants to do the same exact workout over and over again? And then those are usually mixed. So maybe you do one on Monday, one on Wednesday, one on Friday, and then on the alternate days, a continuous session. It is more typical of what you think of a of aerobic exercise, maybe 30 minutes on the treadmill or on the bike at we would recommend at least 75% of your max heart rate. So one of the things that I was gonna show you on a slide that you're just gonna to have to imagine in your mind is how do we track this? So Mark and his team write these beautiful exercise prescriptions. They say, I want this crew member to go on the bike at, at this load or do this lifting on the A-RED. And then one of the things that the exercise lab does is get this data back down and graph it and put it in a format that's easy to understand um, so that the flight surgeons and the ACERs don't have to spend a lot of time poring over spreadsheets, but they can look at a, a graph or a chart. Um, so we have heart rate monitors on station. Things that are easy here on Earth, like putting on a heart rate monitor and having it read to your watch and then downloading it to your computer are not at all easy on the station. So we have had heart rate monitoring problems ever since I've been here. Um, just today, we have some brand new Bluetooth heart, mon heart rate monitors deployed on station that two crew members are trying that sync to an iPad. And so, so we're kind of excited about these new technologies. But um, what we do is we get the heart rate from every exercise session. We change it to a percentage of the person's max and a percentage of their prescribed. And then we graph it in a bar graph. And we have a green, yellow, and a red zone. So we're not exactly sure how to define green, yellow, and red. That's just one of the things we're trying to do. Um, but for now, the red zone is lower than 70%. And we strip out the warm up and the cool down. So we're just graphing the actual workout. And if you're 60, 50, 60%, your bar is going to end in the red zone. The yellow zone is in the. Um, 70 to 85, and the green zone is above 85. So one of the pieces of research we're doing is trying to narrow in on where should we be? Does everyone have to be in the green zone all the time? Could you be in yellow some of the time? And there is a, several series of studies in the research literature that we were able to leverage. And I'm going to tell you about one, which is probably my favorite set of research studies ever. Um, they were done in the early 80s, so it's not even new work. Um, they didn't re get really famous. I'm not quite sure why, because they were very cool. But they're super applicable for space flight, because we're looking to maintain people's fitness. We're not really looking to improve their fitness while they fly in space. We'd be very happy and excited if we could just keep them flatlined. So, so this, this guy, Dr. Hickson, recruited a lot of people, like 150 people. And his question was, if I want to maintain fitness, what's the most important thing? Intensity of exercise, duration of exercise, or frequency? So these are the three parts of an exercise prescription. My intensity, how hard do I do it? My duration, how long do I do it? And the frequency, how many days a week do I do it? Or how many times a day do I do it? What's the most important? for maintaining your fitness. Because this will be good to know, and we can drop off on whatever is less important and lift up whatever is the most important. So he trained up a lot of people. I don't know how he did this. It's like 150 people, and they came and they did this really high intensity training program. It was six days a week, and they were exercising an hour a day at a really high intensity, like 90% of their max heart rate. So they must have had some breaks in there. So he trained up a whole bunch of people. And then he split them into these different groups. He split them into six groups. So, and each group reduced something. So the intensity group reduced their intensity. So they kept training 
six days a week for an hour, but half of them reduce their workload by one third and half of them reduce their workload by two thirds. So a one third reduction in the workload is not a lot. The, the, if you put it into a heart rate, for those of you who ever measure your heart rate when you exercise, it would be like going from 170 to 150 on your heart rate. So 15, still high. And then the two thirds was down, down below that. He had another group that reduced their duration. So they went, instead of 60 minutes, they went to 45 minutes, and then some other people went to 30 minutes. So they, they cut that down. And another group reduced their frequency. Instead of six days a week, there was a four days a week and a two or three days a week. And they measured everything you could imagine on these people. They left no stone unturned on measuring them. So they let them go 10 or 12 weeks in this reduced training. And then they checked to see how everyone did, to see who were the, who were the winners, who, were, who was able to maintain. Any guesses who maintained? Mark, you can't play. <laughs> <laughs> what group fared the best? Kept the intensity and the duration, they reduced the days. So they just skipped some days. She's exactly right. <laughs> who fared the best, or the, who suffered the most in terms of losing their fitness? What was the worst thing? Like, whose fitness was really bad at the end of this study? Oh, the intensity. The intensity. Even a one-third reduction in the intensity, they lost all of the training benefits for the cardiovascular system. So that was training from like 170 down to 150. 20 beats a minute, deal breaker. Um, the group that did the high intensity, but the, it was like 15 or 20 minutes a day, two or three days a week, so they did this high intensity but really minimal on everything else, they maintained most of their benefits. They, they, they had a loss in their long-term endurance, so it was a two-hour cycling time trial. So they didn't, they didn't fare so well, but they fared very well on the half-hour cycling time trial. So what we learned from this is that if we want to, how can we translate this ground research done at a university to a spaceflight program? What we took from that was if we, can't, if we have to make some cuts due to schedule or problems, let's cut frequency, then let's cut duration, and let's not budge a bit on intensity. So how do you operationalize this? What do you do about this? One of the things is that you tell the crew members, this is the intensity, Mark will tell them, this is the intensity we want you to do. This is really important for you to do. And if you say you can't do it, it's too hard up in space, or you're too tired, you had a bad day, he's going to tell you, I'm not lowering it. Just, just try. Go as much as you can. If you can't do the whole thing, OK, take a break, and then pick back up again. But we're not going to lessen. We're not gonna lessen the intensity where we can lessen the duration or the frequency, and then quickly they'll get built up back up to that. Um, moving on to bone. So we were looking, the reason we were doing all of this research was to inform, at the time, what was a new exercise program, which is a research study called SPRINT. You may have heard of it. Um, it had a bed rest. Some of you definitely know about the bed rest correlate, which was that same exercise program in bed rest, which is now completed. Um, so what we learned from that was in these sprint exercises, we're going as hard as we can on intensity, and we'll shorten some of those other things. We looked at the literature for bone, and we said, what do we know about bone? And we found some really interesting things. Um, but they're harder to translate into spaceflight because most of the really beautiful, elegant bone studies are done in animals. Why, why would they be done in animals and not humans? Like almost all of them are done in animals. Why not? 
Okay. Yeah, exactly. You need to do destructive tissue analyses. You need to take the bone out and see if it breaks. With a human, we could measure its density. There's a lot of debate about what actual information you get from that. What the researchers really want to know is what does it take to make this bone break or fracture? Um, what is its strength? So the best studies are, are done in rodents. So we had to make the leap which I usually don't like to do, but in this case, we had to do that. Um, but there were some beautiful studies in bone. One that, that we really latched onto was they, they did loading cycles, and in the rodents, they either have to train them to do weightlifting, like tie things on them and get them to climb a ladder, or they just mechanically exercise them. They found that 360 loading cycles in a row gave you the same result as 36 loading cycles in a row. Like, man, darn it for the <laughs> doing all that exercise didn't get a benefit. So they started to follow up on this, and what they found was that the bone has mechanical sensors in it that quickly adapt. But if you split those out and you did like 36 10 times a day with a break in between, you got a huge benefit. But if you did 360 all in a row, no. No better than doing the 36. So it's like a waste of time. Now, can you say that translates exactly to humans? Probably not. But what we do know is that the bone readily sensitizes to the load. So when we wanted to operationalize this for a spaceflight research study, I was new then, I'll have to admit. Went and said, well, we'd like to exercise four times a day <laughs> on the A-RED and just do a few reps and then take a break and do a few more. Got laughed out of the place by the schedulers and everyone. You can't possibly, that is impractical. So what we settled on was three days a week, we'd do two-a-day sessions. So we'd split the aerobic exercise and the resistance exercise by at least four hours. Because in the rodent studies, it was a minimum of four hours recovery time. Um, so that's one of the things we're evaluating in this sprint study and in this bed rest study is the timing of the exercise sessions, particularly with respect to bone. Um, the bone loading is very site specific. So remember when Mark talked about the undulating periodization? In addition to that, a detail that, that he didn't mention was how much they mix up the exercises. So when he says squat, they've got all kinds of versions of the squat. So there's single leg, two leg, narrow stance, wide stance. Um, same with the, the deadlift. There's a variety of, of types of deadlift. Well, if you are squatting with your feet like this or your feet turned out, you're getting entirely different loads on the femoral neck. So the idea is to mix it up as much as possible, have the crew members do a wide variety of loads and a wide variety of stances. So the other fancy part of that periodization scheme is that you're not doing the same load on the exact same exercise, but I don't know, once a month or once every three weeks or something like that. So when you're doing kind of a heavy load with a wide stance, the next time you do heavy load, it would be with the narrow stance. And so there's a tremendous amount of variety built into that periodization scheme because the bone loading is so site specific and site sensitive. Um, from the muscle point of view, we went into the literature and said, what, what protects the muscle? And there's two things that pop up. The calf is a real bugger. <laughs> um, and there are so many studies out there that, that have looked at the muscle that it was a little hard to find something in common that we could say, oh yeah, this worked in all these research studies, so that means that's what we should do in spaceflight. There, nothing really popped up. The only commonality was that the studies that were able to fully protect muscle used maximal contractions on a pretty regular basis. Um, but there were all kinds of different exotic exercise devices, flywheels, treadmills with negative pressure in them, all kinds of fancy stuff, just plain old weight stacks. And some of them worked, some of them didn't. But the commonality for a successful program was maximal or nearly maximal contractions much of the time. 
So one of the ways this was built into the operational exercise program um, was to have one of the examples he showed was four sets of 10 reps. So, so someone might be assigned four sets of 10 reps. How do you make that nearly maximal? Or how do you know what load that person should do to be maximal? So there's a really simple way to do that. And that is, if you suspect that 100 pounds is a good load for them, so we might have Charlene come up and do, we're going to give her squatting four sets of 10 with 100 pounds. So you're going to do one set of 10, take a rest, take another set of 10, take a rest on the Third set, take a rest. Now she's on her fourth and final set. And we're going to tell her, give us as many reps as you can. And that's going to be her, her test. If she can only eke out 10, and on number nine, she's like, oh, I'm almost done. And 10, she's done. Then we say, we got the load perfect. If she can do 20 reps on that last set, then we're going to say, it is time to increase your load because this is getting too easy for you. And if she can only do three on that last set, then we're going to say, I guess we overdid it. We'll lower. And so in that way, you can make every workout a, a maximal effort or have some maximal efforts at least near, near the end of it. And so we package that all together for a spaceflight research study. Um, it's a very operational research study because Mark and his group are the ones that implement this. But then we do a lot of extra testing on those crew members. So the standard medical tests that all crew members do would include a VO2 max test. So that's a cycle test where you go and the load keeps getting higher and higher until you can't go anymore. It's the gold standard measure of overall physical fitness. Um, there are some muscle tests, both lab-based, like isometric, isokinetic, that test single joints to more complex 1RM on the leg press and more functional tests, like how many pull-ups can you do? So there's a wide variety of muscle tests. And there's a bone test, which is DEXA, which just looks at bone mineral density. Those aren't enough tests, nor were they ever designed to be enough tests to tell us why an exercise program works or doesn't work. What you get is, at the end, you maintained, you didn't maintain, you lost a lot, you improved. It's kind of too late, right? After the fact, we can say, well, I guess that didn't work so well, or I guess that worked great. <laughs> so in the research study, we have additional tests built in um, so that we get a more complete picture of why this exercise program worked or not. So let's go back to that 30 second interval. Remember that I said it was really good at the muscle level for improving the capillary density and the enzymes? So in the research study, we take a muscle biopsy before and after the flight. Sounds kind of freaky. It's actually really pretty easy um, and easy for the crew member. And we're, at, we're looking at that capillary density and those enzymes to see, are we affecting that? We do echocardiography of the heart so that we can look at the mechanics of the heart, the squeezing and twisting. You can actually measure the twist. And you can measure the types of strain on the heart and do elegant cardiac mechanics just with echocardiography. Um, they go over to Victory Lakes and they do MRIs of the of the leg so that we can look at the muscle size of each individual muscle to say, OK, we did well for this one. We did not do so well for that one. Um, in addition to the DEXA, which gives you the bone mineral density, we also do QCT, which gives you an idea of the bone architecture. So there's kind of two issues with the bone. You could just have the density, but then the architecture is what's on the inside of the bone. So the inside of the bone looks like a lattice work, and the outside of the bone is thick and cortical. And so the, how those work together can help determine the strength of the bone and is important. Um, we have a variety of muscle performance measurements um, that, that are lab-based. Another one looks at the, the neuromuscular system. So, this is scientifically really cool, but it's kind of a weird test to participate in. And that is we get you in a knee extension machine. So that's you're seated. 
and there's a bar here that you push out against, and we lock it so you can't move it and just measure how hard can you push. Maybe you can push with the 100 pounds. We say give us a maximal effort, okay? 110 is the max, so we write down 110. And then we ask you to do it again, but while you're doing it again, you get a supramaximal electric stimulation. So you can, you can get more force. So we look at the difference between what you can voluntarily produce with your force and what you can really do if we help with the activation. And so to look at that deficit. So you may not realize this, but no one here in this room can activate 100% of their muscle all the, you know, on one effort. So 80 to 90% is kind of average. So we're looking at, does that get better or worse with space flight? Different, different kinds. Um, so that's the research study sprint. Its sister study was looking at that same exercise program in bed rest. The study just finished, so we're, we're mulling over the results and, and pulling those together. With the, the, the other measurement that, that I want to tell you about in the spaceflight study is new, and the, the team that developed this just won a, innovation, a group innovation award for in-flight muscle ultrasound. So you think of ultrasound for measuring the heart, right? Or looking at peripheral injuries or babies in utero. Or that. I mean, that's how you think of, of ultrasound. But you know panoramic photography with your camera, like even your cell phone now, you can set it on panorama mode. And what happens when you set your, your cell phone camera on panorama mode? You stay really still and you go like this, right? And as long as you're still and you do a good job with it, it will stitch together these images and give you one big, long image. And you know, people do it for a sunset or something like that. Well, we can do this with ultrasound now. And so what we can do is get ultrasounds of the muscle. And so they take an ultrasound probe, and it's just like the panoramic photography. You have to be really steady, and you start around here, and you just rotate it around. And if you're really smooth and steady, it'll stitch together the images. It'll wrap around, and you have this image of the leg. And so we can now do this in flight. And we're, we're doing this in flight with this research study and comparing the loads that were lifted on ARED for that month with the muscle size of those respective muscles for that month to try to hone in on was that load enough to maintain? Yes or no for this crew member or that crew member? And understand some of the variability that Mark was talking about. Like some crew members do really well, some don't. Um, so we're trying to, to understand some of those things. The, the other thing that I wanted to tell you about is kind of forward work. So that's an example of some of the work that we're doing, research and to, to affect ISS operations. But another aspect of, of our research is looking at exploration environments and what kind, we're getting pretty good at exercise programs for six months on ISS with the suite of equipment that we have up there. Well, where are the holes? What do we still not know? One relates to balance and sensory motor function. And I'm guessing there's a reason that Mark showed you week two and week three videos from reconditioning. Week one sometimes doesn't look so good. Um, so one of the, the forward plans is to try to develop some sensory motor countermeasures that can be combined with exercise. So like walking on an unstable platform, walking with head movements. We're doing some work with the sensory motor lab and Jacob Bloomberg's group over there to try to start to incorporate some balance challenges and sensory motor in with regular exercise so that that we can, you know, that could be another, our next big step forward. Um, and then another one is how do you, what exercise hardware do you need for a three year Mars mission? What exercise hardware do you need on a Mars transit vehicle? Do you have to have a treadmill? There's a whole group of people that says you can't go to Mars without a treadmill. You need to maintain the walking, patterns, the, the loading for the bone, plus it's a good 
cardiovascular or metabolic exercise. There are other people who say, a treadmill is too complicated, it's too heavy, it draws too much power. Are you sure you really need that? Because that's a, that's a lot of resources. Um, what do you need for resistance exercise? What kind of redundancy do you need? How do you develop some tests during the mission to know if you're on the mark or not? How do you develop tests when they land to know they're ready to go out the door for EVAs? or whether they have to train up a little bit more on their balance, or maybe their balance is fine, but their cardio is not. Or, um, so, so that's our forward work, is looking at requirements for exercise hardware for long duration missions. Um, the other area that, that we're starting to collaborate with more is the behavioral health group. So we're pretty good on six month ISS missions, but imagine for yourself, that for three years, you're gonna live in one house with the same people and the same one or two exercise devices. But maybe you've got a cycle and a weightlifting thing. That's what you've got for exercise. Can you imagine exercising for a year every day on the same bike, looking at the same wall, and there's only so many programs Mark and his group can come up with for the, for the cycle. So. Um, there's a very rapidly emerging technologies on the ground related to exergaming and virtual environments. And this has really gone crazy in the cycling. I don't know if there's any cyclists in the audience, but there is some amazing commercially available cycling tools. Um, at the HRP workshop a few weeks ago, we had a demonstration of that. Um, <coughs> And you can actually, if you're training for a triathlon or a cycling race, you can buy a course virtually. And then you ride that course. You have to have a, a cycle trainer. So you put your bike on a cycle trainer. You can buy the Kona Ironman cycle course and you download it and you ride the course and it shows you the scenery and it's programmed to interface with your bike so that when you're up a hill, it increases the resistance. And so you can train virtually for different courses. Um, there's some gaming software in which you can race with other people. And so you just see who's online and you, know, you can go and see people from all over the world doing this course and, and race with them and communicate with them. So that is a really expanding area of technology. And so that's another area of, of research that we'll be getting into in the future is, does this enhance motivation? There's also some really fascinating research on social connectedness and how people connect with virtual partners and computer partners and um, some fascinating research on the ground um, with that. And so could you imagine on a long duration mission, you know, instead of buying the Kona Ironman cycle course, you buy the site, you get the cycle course for your neighborhood with your family riding too, or you get to, um, and so enhancing exercise from the behavioral health point of view, both motivation to do the exercise at a high enough intensity, but also for, for social isolation and, and countermeasures in that regard. So I think we were supposed to save some time for discussion and questions. And in the absence of the slides, those are the parts that I can tell you about in, without pictures. Um, so I'm happy to take questions, or if you've thought of other questions, for Mark, we kind of come as a team, so. For your 30 second exercises that uh, benefit the muscles and the, the capillaries, uh, if you're doing that, for instance, uh, on a cycle, uh, does that have any effect on your arms or other muscles, the upper body? So, not much. The, the extent to which it could benefit the whole body is just that it, it does get your heart rate up and but you're not gonna increase the blood flow to the upper body if you're cycling lower body. So it's pretty site specific. So if, I was to say, if you wanted to do upper body, you could do the arm crank or, or some other upper body exercise, but it's pretty specific. Um, you could probably also do something like swimming or cross country skiing that uses a, most all of the muscle mass if you wanna get a quadruple dipping, so to speak. Any of the research or any of the data come back saying that they can get that same 
effect with the protocols and stuff using less time is it's really a tough thing to Yeah. So that's a great question. The the sprint study will in part help answer that, but I, whenever anyone asks that question, I say I have two answers. One is from a physiology alone, just pure exercise physiology point of view, almost certainly yes. Uh, what exactly that looks like, we're trying to find out. And you know, if you were hard pressed to say what is absolutely the bare bone minimum exercise you need to do, you could probably answer that. My second part of the answer is the behavioral health element considers exercise as a countermeasure as well. And all of their planning and their habitable volumes that they provide for Mars transit, and in all of their programs, they assume that they have exercise as a countermeasure. And so while you might be able to get physical benefits from short, high intensity work, you can't just assume then that you could reduce the exercise time because a lot of people, and Mark can speak to this, maybe most people value the exercise time from a behavioral health, stress reduction, relaxing, owning that time, being able to listen to music on the treadmill or watch a show or whatever it is they like to do. You have anything to add to that? So physically, maybe yes. Mentally, I don't know. Or is, would the advantage be worth it? I mean, we've all seen in our own office, if, you're work, if you feel really good and you're well rested and you had your usual exercise and you're good, you can work very efficiently. And on a day when you're just dragging and not feeling good and feeling down, you can work longer and get less done. So it's, it's a delicate balance. Maybe a second question would be, in working with the Russians over the years, have you found differences in their approach to how you do it? And I know this is a, it was a loaded question, but. Oh, we're exactly what, the same. What's part of the, the science of exercise are, are they on the track for, and then we are on a different one, but we're getting data and we're sharing it and we're finding out we both have things that we're learning. Are we any words like that, or they have just a strict on Russian and pounding it type of thing versus a Society, like oh, we should both answer because we'll have different perspectives. Yeah, 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 oh, I was going to say you go first. <laughs> All right, so I interface mostly with the research community on the Russian side, um, and they are here at NASA, we're not very separated, the research and the operations. We talk all the time, we share a lot of the same things. Over there, they're very separate. Very separated. So depending which side you talk to, you could get a very different answer. Um, but in general, they are more cautious with exercise. I suspect that their um, pre-flight medical screening of the crew may be different. And so they are not as enthusiastic about high intensity exercise. Um, they, we consider the astronaut kind of as an athlete in the prescription of the exercise and as you saw from his presentation, the approach to training them. The, the Russian point of view emphasizes more the sensory motor and the muscle tone and sort of the quality of the muscle, whereas we're more concerned about the function, the strength, the power. Um, they are very strong advocates of the treadmill. The lead Russian scientists will be the first ones to tell you we can't go to Mars without a treadmill. Can't do it. Um, because they believe so much in the muscle tone and the balance and the proprioception and you need the walking patterns which you might, according to them, lose if you were not able to do them. Um, the Russians do not have a resistance exercise device. I don't know that they ever have. Um, and so that is not a priority for them, though then Mark can tell you how much they like to use the A-Ray. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they don't, they have a, they, they take a completely different approach from the resistive exercise standpoint. Uh, they use our device, but not all of them. 
So it's it's just voluntary that they want to use it. We trained them on it, and then they they're, they're, they can use it. Uh, they don't do anything. Even the ones that do use it don't do anything comparable to what we do. I don't. We don't write protocols for them. They're in charge of writing their own protocol. Mm -hmm. So they're and for the most part, the ones that do it are just kind of left on their own. They just kind of they'll look at some of the things our guys are doing. And they might try to mimic some of that, but that's, you know, pretty much it. Um, and as far as the treadmill thing goes, I will say this. We, I mean, we've had crew members that have flown that have predominantly done cycle as opposed to treadmill. You see a couple that didn't do too well back when they got back, and other ones, would, you could, if you, if I'd have told you, you wouldn't have known. But other ones, you could have gone in there. But was that due to not being on the treadmill? As much as other people, I don't know. We can speculate about it. So, but like she said, they're they're real big on the treadmill. <laughs> so, so Lori, yes. uh, you were talking about these new concepts with the gaming technology, and the, so how how is that going to happen here? Would you team with EHP and in we don't really have that expertise in house, though, do we? So, yes and no. Right now, we have, through NSBRI, the National Space and Biomedical Research Institute, funded an external investigator at a university whose line of work is motivation and exercise. Mm -hmm. And she is doing conducting a study with a virtual partner. Basically, she has shown that if you pair someone with a slightly more capable partner, this has been well known in mm -hmm. sports psychology, you get the greatest motivation. No one wants to be the worst. Not everyone aspires to be the best, but nobody wants to be the weak link or the worst one on the team or of the duo. So it is very highly motivating to partner someone with a slightly more capable partner. They've shown that you can get about half this motivation effect with a fake cyber computer partner. And that humans, there's research on what aspects of a computerized thing people will bond with, but people bond with computers pretty well. <laughs> um, so she's looking, well, you know, people talk to their GPS, they yeah, name right. them. Um, I just heard on NPR a study with kids where if they were asked to do bad things to a Barbie doll, they would. But if it was a Furby or some kind of like computerized hamster, they wouldn't do any bad things to it because, you know, they identified with it. Um, so it, it's more potent than you might think. Um, so that is the first step, is a research study, and she is, it's really a proof of concept. Does this enhance the physical part of it? Do we get better motivation? Do we get better compliance in community dwelling people? Will they show up to work out more often if the virtual partner is waiting for them? Will they stay at the high intensity? Her early work is yes, in fact. Exercising with the virtual partner is better than no, no partner at all. So, so that's the first step, is some university research to look at the proof of concept of this. Meanwhile, the, the commercial side of things is going crazy, and they're selling this stuff. And our, our notion some days to bring these together and work with behavioral health, and we can access, we don't need all the expertise in-house because we can solicit for grants and get it's just, the it's best like people it's working be on it. It's a different, different realm that you're going to have to search for these, you know? Well, and one of the things we've talked with BHP, we have no firm plans, but one of the things we've talked to them is about um, the next study or the next one after that being in an isolated environment. It doesn't have to be space flight, but could be an analog. Both of you talked a bit about um, varying intensity levels. Is um, percentage of maximum heart rate kind of the main metric you use to gauge that, that intensity variation? I would say from, from the research point of view, if we want to look at the intensity for that individual, we would prefer percentage of maximal aerobic capacity or VO2 max. That is 
orders of magnitude more difficult to get, so percentage of max heart rate becomes the next best surrogate. From a prescription point of view, though, they will often prescribe a certain workload, and we work with them back and forth to, to estimate that's a workload that should produce this heart rate. Like and with weight or a well, speed or a well, yeah. Well, I I know if if you do the cycle test and you you stop your aerobic capacity VO2 at 450 watts, I should be able to take 90 percent of that and say that's your 90 percent workload for a given period of time. I don't expect you to do it for 35 minutes, but you can do that for you know three four minutes probably. So that's kind of where you come up with. So it might be just workload dependent. On a treadmill, it might be speed dependent. How fast can you run and then work off that speed? Okay. So same thing. Yeah. Okay. You know what? Thank you. Thank you, Lori and Mark. Thanks to all of us. Yeah. You know, thank you. As you can see, the lecture was well received. Lots of questions for you. And so, of course, if you guys have any more questions, feel free to contact them. And also, if we can help in any way, let us know also. Uh, Lori's file is pretty large, so we don't know that we'll be able to make it available to all. But please visit her and uh, see if there can be some arrangements made. I think we'll, we'll figure it out if you'd like to see the slides. I'll figure out a way to make it. Okay, well, I want to thank all of you, and uh, let's give our lecturers a round of applause. If you have a sign in, please sign in. Also, fill out your uh, survey forms and return them. And our next event is on February 10th. We have a counter measures and uh, exercise physiology.